Young Melee, was once one of the best characters in the GTA franchise. That is until he got fired, causing not only the downfall of CJ, but Melee himself. But to understand how this happened, we must visit the very beginning of Young Melee's identity. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The East Coast Crips are the largest black gang located on the east side of Los Angeles, with 13 subsets operating in the surrounding neighborhoods. Some of these sets being the First Street East Coast Crips, 59, 62, 66, 68, 69, 76, 89, 97, Q102, 118, 190, and finally, the Six Pack Coast Block Crips. The First Street East Coast Crips to the Q102s are considered East Coast Neighborhood Crips, and everything from the 118 to 1200 block falls under the East Coast Block Crips. Though you can hear a solo, put it on for the Neighborhood Crip card. I was from a neighborhood around here called Neighborhood Crips. Oh, neighborhood Crips. Founder Raymond Washington formed the Crips in 1969, with many people suggesting that the name came from the word Crips, and others saying that it came from a rumor gang called the Cripplers in the 1970s. But whatever the truth is, no one can deny that the East Side Crips are in fact the very first set to ever exist, later becoming what we know today as the East Coast Crips in which many people believe that this name came from the coastline-like formation of their hood, or even the word East Coast just being another way of saying East Side. But to answer the question that's on everyone's mind, what gang does Young Melee belong to? It is documented that Young Melee belongs to the 87 Kitchen Crips, who holds it down on 87th Street, 87th Place, along Hooper Avenue. However, this information is unfortunately wrong. You see, Young Melee belongs to the 97 East Coast Crips, which is confirmed by his next of kin, Sean Fantino, also known as Solo, who holds membership to the 118 East Coast Block Crips. Were y'all both in the same gang growing up? Yeah, we was, we wasn't in the, we from the same gang, but it's different streets. I was okay. from um, 118th Street, he was, he was from 97th Street but it was called East Coast Crips. But Melee did grow up on 97th Street, being not too far from the Kitchen Crips. Just a 20 minute walk between the two, in which Melee grew up watching this bloody feud between the two gangs, and eventually he would become involved in the Dilly Feud. Back then, he, see you gotta remember man, Melee is an active, what well, was, I don't know if Melee's still banging, but Melee, Melee was an active hothead. I'm talking about a hothead with the bullshit, a heavy stepper. Christopher Melee Bellard was born on June 17, 1979, and witnessing the aftermath of the crack era, which started early as 1981, just three years after Melee's birth. Basically living the same life as Franklin Saint from Snowfall. You see, the East Coast Crips were heavily involved in trafficking cocaine, especially in the 1990s and the early 2000s. This would also put them in a warlike state, causing conflict with the surrounding gangs, the Pablo Bishop Bloods, the Mad Swan Bloods, the Bebop Watts Bloods, the Brims, the Broadway Gangster Crips, the Mafia Crips, the Kitchen Crips, the Grape Street Crips, and number 9 being a Mexican street gang called Florentia 13, which kicked off into one of the biggest race wars between the two gangs. With many people alleging that the East Coast Crips robbed a member of Florencia 13 for a large amount of dope. However, there is no evidence to support this theory. Over the years, the two gangs battled over control for the drug trade, putting a 13 year old melee in the middle of all this. So a 13 year old melee was indeed busting on the ballas in real life. Because if you didn't know, the ballas are a fictional gang in San Andreas that grabs influence from the Grape Street Crips and the Bloods gang. And this can be confirmed by NPC dialogue referring to them as strawberries. Ball sucker strawberries! Which is the color red to represent the Bloods and the purple to represent the Grape Street Crips. But Melee wasn't known for being just a respected gang member. He would also be known for his relationships with industry muggles such as King T and DJ Poon, both who hold affiliation to the Crips. DJ Pooh belonging to the Watergate Crips 
while King T holds affiliation to the Nutty Black Crips. <laughs> Not officially a gang member, but let's just say um, I was just part of the family, you know, running around with guns, pulling guns on, you know, taking people's stuff and things like that. Just being a kid, but it was stupid. During the 80s, gangster rap would emerge, showing the world the gritty streets of Los Angeles. Our American agenda tonight because of fear. Fear that what started out as music to inform has turned into music that incites. Not only was a bloody feud going on between the Bloods and Crips, but the LAPD as well. Many of the titles suggest violence, sex, drug use, and profanity. In fact, I can't even say some of the names of the songs on television. The group's name itself is controversial. N with Attitude, known as NWA, has taunted law enforcement with its lyrics urging violence against police. The relationship formed with King T and DJ Pooh opened a door for Young Melee, establishing a relationship even with the rap legend himself, Ice Cube. At 21 years old, a Young Melee had it all. His music career was finally taken off, making his first hit appearance on Killer Taste Dog Tussle with the song Number One's Hottest Coast, Killer Cali, in the year 2000. And just two years later, he appeared on Rodney O's and Joe Cooley's Summer Heat in 2002. And during this time, the Kitchen Crips were ending their beef with rivals. This included the East Coast Crips. Not only did this end the Crip on Crip violence, between the two gangs, but opened the door for opportunities for both sections. Right. And I look back at people I got tattooed on me when we were kids, they died at 16 and 17. I can't believe we were only, I'm a dad now, you know what I mean? So I, I can't believe we was only 15 and 16 right. doing grown man ass shit and actually having warfare like we in Vietnam somewhere and having the pressure. I was calling my mom one time. I remember a time when you said, and this was early, I was in my 20s and my mom calling her every day for like two weeks because it was so popping. Mm that I was thinking I wasn't gonna make it. You yep. know what I mean? So I didn't want to tell her, hey, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I was like, hey mom, I love you. Hey, this, that, and the third, I love you. And I made a point to car because we about to go outside. And we go outside, Straps is on the lap. And as soon as we see them, it's active on sight. But once they both made peace, Young Trade the Truth from 87 Kitchen Crip and Young Melee from 97 East Coast formed a rap clique between the two, calling themselves the original block Gangster Rider Clique basically being a modern day nationwide rip riders. But what really launched his career was a phone call with DJ Pooh. Hey, what's up? Which took place during 2002 or 2003. DJ Pooh just landed a job at Rockstar Games, working on a video game that would change the game space completely. The game's concept involved a kid from the streets of Los Santos, the fictional city based on Los Angeles. The main character of the game went by the name CJ, belonging to the Grove Street families, a street gang loosely based off the Crips. But what made this game so special is that it touched many topics within the gangland of LA, from rival gangs, racial politics, and losing loved ones due to gang violence, such as CJ's little brother, Little Brian, who would be struck down at the age of 10. And the game would even focus on crooked cops having multiple references to the LA riots in 1992, which Melee would experience firsthand. It was violence, it was police cars, it was looting. People were smashing and grabbing in South Central. Making the game relatable to anyone who grew up in the streets. So best believe that this game hit home for many people. This game had to be perfect. Realism was DJ Pooh's main concern. So he picked up the phone and guess who picked up? Well, actually, uh, DJ Pooh. Oh, mm. shout out DJ Pooh. Yeah, so. he was um he was in a meeting with Rockstar Games, and uh, I had no idea. Uh, he had called me, and um, we was having a regular conversation. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, he was in a meeting with them. They heard me talking. DJ Pooh hangs up, and let's just say, Rockstar fell in love with the realism, energy and tone of Young Melee. So they invited him to the audition, in which Young Melee of course agreed and pulled up to the location. But once he arrived, he realized it was Pat. Yeah, but um, I get over there, I pull up. It's a line wrapped around the building. I'm like, damn, they uh -oh. told me and a million other motherfuckers. After waiting hours on end, he eventually got in and they would hand him a paper to read off. This would be the carjacking in Menace to Society, 
Melee had the producers scared and amazed at the same time. This would land them a contract with Rockstar Games, signing an NDA and putting in crazy hours of voice work. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas blew up. Every kid in America had their hands on the game. But of course, this came with backlash from parents and the media. Representatives that the Federal Trade Commission should investigate the publication of the video game Grand Theft Auto San Andreas to determine if the publisher intentionally deceived the Entertainment Software Ratings Board to avoid an adults-only rating. They will be forced to make changes to the game. But this didn't stop the game from blowing up, surpassing every game released in 2005. He would eventually start his own independent label, Melanium Music, with his money from GTA San Andreas. And he would even drop a GTA themed mixtape titled San Andreas, the original. I'm from Grove Street, keep a green rag on me. Los Santos, so G, homie, I'm from Grove Street. Everybody know the name, and G R O V E is the guy. Sometime between 2006 and 2009, Melee had a falling out with an employee at Rockstar, so he thought. But he wasted no time in responding back to Rockstar. What you got going with him, I would love to see if you could get on the phone with, you know, Sam. Um, preferably Sam. I don't want to say anybody because Sam, you and Sam got a history. You feel what I'm saying? I'm like this. To be honest, them motherfuckers ain't got to never do shit for me again. The thing of it was this. I just feel a certain type of way. If if I make a billion dollars, if I make a million dollars with a motherfucker, man, I'm going to try to make sure they cool. When you... When you convince, when you try to, when you try to convince somebody that they family, and then you treat them like they not afterwards, that's some bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Now, is it my fault for believing it? Yeah. Um. Well, I think. I don't, I don't, now let me be. Feel like they, now let me be the, the the the. I'm gonna correct you on that. Um. You might say I'm wrong, but I think. I think when you was here, I think things have changed. Cause how long? How long was you in, in uh, communications with them after your game? For a while, for a little while, four years, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, for a few years. Yeah, for years. I think a, I think a lot of things have changed. Though many fans assumed that this was over a payment Melee received, assuming he got ripped off and paid dirt cheap for his role as CJ, leaving many GTA YouTubers to cover the situation. But the truth is. This was all just a misunderstanding between Melee and a fake employee. So it turns out that a troll wrote Melee, calling him out his name, and the only reason Melee believed him was due to the troll knowing personal information on the voice actor. Name, and he just snapped, you know, and he went away when he don't he don't have no animosity like that towards Rockstar. Yeah, he might feel a, a light way, but not like how people take it. He just took it out of context, you know what I'm saying? This impacted Melee in a major way, placing him on the do not hire list for Rockstar Games. But after all the conflict with Rockstar, he would be picked up and signed under Ice Cube's Lynch Mob Records in 2008. <laughs> This would spark controversy when people assumed Young Melee was signed to replace MAC-10 in the infamous West Coast Connection group, which Melee responded saying this, I would not say no shit like that. I would be out my lane to speak on that situation. That's the West Coast Connection, and I'm from the East Side. I am not from the West Side nothing. Ice Cube and Melee's relationship was strong, long before the rap game. Ice Cube even considered him a veteran in and out of the booth. Ice Cube grew up in the neighborhood of the 111 neighborhood Crips, so his relationship with surrounding Crips was A-OK, -okay, which is likely how he met Melee and Solo. But over his situation in 1995, some drama would erupt between Solo, Ice Cube, and affiliates of the two. This could have affected Melee's career pretty bad, because if the 1995 beef would have gone another way, who knows what would have happened. During the making of the movie Friday, Ice Cube was looking for soundtracks for the movie and he stumbled across a track called Roll It Up, Light It Up, Smoke It Up. At first, he really liked the vibe of the track, but it didn't really fit the feel he was going for. We played him a song called Throw Your Set in the Air and he was like, oh, that's banging. That shit is banging. Can, uh, can I get that for the movie instead? But unfortunately, they would say no, turning into a complete shit show between Cypress Hill, Cube, and Solo. He says, hey man, uh, did you give Q 
cue uh, the song from your record for for the Friday thing. Like yeah, the the, the the get high song. Yeah, we gave that up already. Why? No, 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 no. The throw your set in the air thing. I said no, we didn't give him that. He goes well, you know that shit is in his chorus in his song. So we're like, nah, you're crazy. But Solo would catch Ice Cube at a stoplight. That's when Solo approached him. And even though Cube stood ten toes down, Solo whooped the complete dog shit out of him. Knocked him down, knocked him out, woke him back up, whooped on his ass. Somehow his chain fell in my hand. I don't know how it got in my hand, but it fell in my hand. Then all of a sudden his Rolex start jumping off and coming into my hand. I don't know how that happened. I guess Solo knocked out Cube and took his West Side Connection chain on and hold it all up into the crowd. Crowd go crazy. They go bananas off of it. And we're like, well, shit, let's take pictures with it. <laughs> and even though the feud happened between 1995 through 1996, this could have prevented Melee from ever being signed under Ice Cube. And if you're wondering whatever happened to Melee, well unlike CJ, he remained in his hood, stacking up the money he earned from the game and remaining loyal to the East Coast Crips. He just was, shit, you know, pay me my money, I'm gonna do what I gotta do, but I'm gonna go back to the hood. And that's what he did, you know, he, he, he got his bread, did his little shit. He went back to who he was, you know what I'm saying? He never changed, he kept it the same, and that's what's so genuine about him is, he never acted like he did like something bigger than somebody or he tried to act like he was bigger than the next person. Holding similar values as Grove Street's leader, Sean Johnson. We got a stake in the casino, we got some insane shit in Fierro, we getting into the rap game. Hey man, let me get you some new clothes, come on. New clothes? Nigga, what the fuck is this bullshit? What you mean, man? What's mine is yours, and you know that. You never did get it, did you, Carl? I need to go check on things in the hood. Man, that's the problem. You always a perpetrator, running from what's real. Melee spent years working hard to get out of the shadows of Carl Johnson, though the comments spammed across his social media love to remind him of the role he once played. He would eventually learn to accept it and embrace it. But it got me tighter and tighter and tighter to where I developed into the artist that I am right now.